Um, this works great. Um, thanks, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Floyd Müller, and I thought I'm going to talk to you about experiencing the body as digital play. I'm from the Exertion Games Lab at RMIT University in Melbourne, Australia, and um, I'm going to um, give you a brief overview of where I come from. Um, I'm originally uh, from Germany, but then um, uh, I um, studied uh, multimedia um, as my background in Australia before I worked in the US uh, for Xerox Park and Fuji Xerox for several years before then returning to grad school at the MIT Media Lab, you might have heard of, and then Media Lab Europe. Then I returned um, into industry, CSIO, before returning to academia, and then I was a fellow at uh, Microsoft Research Asia um, when they developed the Kinect. And then I was lucky to get a Fulbright Fellowship to visit Stanford for one year before I um, then started the Exertion Games Lab in Australia. And currently, I'm actually on a sabbatical at the Hasse Plattner Institute in Berlin. Um, if you want to know where Melbourne is, Melbourne is all the way up there, and we are kind of here right now. Give you an idea how we see the world. Um, this is the, uh, the building we are in. We occupy one floor in here um, in Melbourne, and that's the design hub. These are the people who do the actual work. I only get to talk about it. Um, we call ourselves the Exertion Games Lab, and our goal is to inspire industry where games can and should be in 10 years' time. And we've got two mantras for that. One is fail and fail often, because we believe through failure we can ac accelerate progress. And the other mantra is show on terror, because we believe if we actually give people an experience that they can try out of our argument, they're much more easily to be convinced than if we just write papers. So I'm going to show you a, a, a whole bunch of examples for the argument I'm going to be making here. In one sentence, we work at the intersection between technology, play, and the body, and we call that exertion games. Um, a more formal definition is um, games that require physical effort mediated by technology. You all know um, probably the most successful initial um, exertion game or early exertion game was Dance Dance Revolution. And then I don't tell you anything new. Then the Wii came along, uh, the Sony Move, the Kinect. But we also consider things such as the Nike Plus system an exertion game because it allows you to get engage in competitions with other joggers. And that's a game. So this is where we are at at the moment. Um, but then if you, you know, the topic of the uh, festival is motivation. If you then look at how people motivate people to engage in these kind of play and game experiences, they do things such as the Nike system, which shows you like a progress bar and how much you achieved of that. Um, you all know Strava um, that shows, you know, for cycling, it gives you like little um, uh, uh, medals and rewards, how fast you are. And now we also have um, things such as um, badges that reward you if you do bodily um, activities such as yoga. This one here gives you a badge. The more hours of yoga you conduct, the more higher you get up in the ranking. And I'm not sure about you, but I think there's come something kind of wrong about rewarding the amount of hours of yoga. Because yoga is not so much about doing as many hours as possible. You might say, oh, now this works fine for me. I've done yoga and I want to get a badge for the more yoga I do. But I'll show you another example where I think it really shows um, where this can go wrong. I'm not sure about, you know, I'm not sure if you know about this app. It's called the Spreadsheets. And it gives you um, badges and rewards on your sexual activity in your bedroom by measuring the duration of your um, performance, the thrusts that it measures with your accelerometer. And the more you do, the higher you go up in the ranking. And then you get also badges for your decibel level that is recorded via the microphone in your bedroom. So this is one approach, right, to motivate people to engage in physical activity call it that way. What I think, uh, what we rather want to see is the experiencing the body as play rather than just a tool to perform physical activity. Um, because we've got the vision in the lab that so far what we have very much been doing since the 80s um, and even earlier is that we came from playing with digital content. We had a mouse and keyboard and we play with digital content. And now with the Kinect and so forth, we are using our bodies to play with the digital content. So we just replace the keyboard 
with our body. But what we rather want is experiencing our bodies as digital play. And what I'm going to show you now is a couple of examples of how we try to facilitate that. So this is pretty much the overview of the talk. I want to try to motivate you to go into that direction. A couple of um, small little academic definitions in order to make sure that we all talk about the same thing. Um, for us, play is very important, but what is actual play? We really like suits because he says playing a game is the voluntary attempt to overcome unnecessary obstacles. You might have heard that before. Um, two things are important here for us, voluntary and unnecessary obstacles. Example is that girl that walks on this plank and um, you know she could have obviously left going into the right or to the left, um, seemed to be much more safe, um, but she chose to voluntarily decide she's only allowed to walk on that plank. And why do people do that? Because they thrive on having overcome that challenge. You know, she's going to look back and go, yes, I did that. And we thrive on that. And that is for us um, play. And that not only applies for children, it applies for adults. This is a tough mother. This is an event that's in two weeks again um, in Melbourne where people voluntarily um, subscribe to going through this mud fest. There's also barbed wire, electric shocks, and you don't even get a prize in the end. And we're going to do that as a team. It's going to be a great team building ex exercise. Um, the other word that's important here is experiencing our body as play. So we need to understand what experience is. And we go by McCarthy and Wright. An experience is an event or a, series of or, or a series of events participated in or lived through. So here's important that experience means there's a beginning and an end. Not just this ongoing life, it really has a beginning and an end. Uh, um, and it's also participated in or lived through. That means you can't outsource that. Think about you're really stressed and you need a holiday, but you don't have time to go on a holiday. You can't outsource that to some um, person um, somewhere else who goes on holiday for you. You, s you have to experience that yourself. And that also means that it's a personal experience. It's different for every person. That, that's what it means by lived through. You have to live through it in order to experience it. And Suits then reminds us that play is an experience. It's a personal account. So we talked about play, we talked about experience, we have to now talk about the body. And I refer to other people like Doug, who remind us that we have a world insofar as we have the bodily capacity to act in that world. Um, took me a while to understand what he means by that. Uh, let me read that again. We have a world insofar as we have the bodily capacity to act in that world. What he's basically trying to say is that the world, as we experience it, only exists because we have a body and we can interact with that body. I can touch this, I can move this, actually I can't move this, <coughs> I could you know, lift that. We can only act in that world. That give be, uh, Sorry, the world only exists because we can act in that world. Without being able to use our bodies to act in that world, the world wouldn't exist. But you might say, but Floyd, like what, what happens if I just sit? If I just sit very quietly, right? The world still exists, does it? If I don't move at all. So the gears get slightly fixed. Um, there's this research. He used um, eye trackers um, to look, um, give people a picture, a painting, and said, look at that painting. And this is what your eyes do. They don't go to one um, fixed point, they always move around. I.e., again, you move, you use your body and your body moves. Even when you seemingly sit still, your eyes constantly perceive the world. So again, you move in order to perceive and therefore that world exists for you. And not only that, we did this really cool experiment where you show the same painting to expert painters. And they look at paintings very differently. And because they look at the painting differently, they perceive a different world, meaning they perceive, uh, um, sorry, they perceive a different painting and therefore they perceive a different world. I'll give you another example. 
hypothesis this is from William James over 100 years ago. He proposed, and we can now prove that with neuroscience, um, he proposed that if you go to the woods and you see a bear, no idea why it was a bear, he always talks about bears, you see a bear, until then it was always believed you see the bear, you perceive the bear, and therefore you experience fear, and therefore you start sweating, your palms get sweaty, your heart races. It's actually the other way around, because you perceive a bear, your palms get sweaty, you start sweating, your heart rate goes up, and therefore you experience fear. So your bodily response to the world comes first, and then as a result, the emotion comes next. And that is super important for game design. Because if you know Guitar Hero, I assume you all know Guitar Hero? Who doesn't know Guitar Hero? Great, all right. Too easy. So you know Guitar Hero when it came out, right? So they gave it to people and said you can play Guitar Hero. And they, they, they've never played Guitar Hero before, right? They played Guitar Hero, and then they asked them afterwards, you know, how much did you like the game? Because it was great, eight out of ten. So then they gave the game to a group of people and told them about star power. Remember star power? And then they asked them, how did you like the game? And they said, it was great. It was 9 out of 10. So just by doing math, they liked the game more. But that was not so much the exciting bit here. The exciting bit here was that this, this group also believed that they were more likely to become rock stars themselves than the other group. And that's the reason why we tennis and all the other games, they don't make you a better tennis player, but they make you believe that you could become a better tennis player because you act in that world and that gives you the feeling that you could become a tennis star. And that means experiencing your body as play. So what I'm going to show you now is a couple of examples of our own work in order to inspire you to experiencing the body as play. First I'm going to show you new technology to experience the body as play via a game called Balance Ninja. Um, then I show you the body as display through an interactive helmet. Then I show you a quadcopters as jogging companions called Jogobot. And then a hospital as a playground, Dr. Giggles, as well as material representations of physical activity, sweat atoms. And I start with Balance Ninja, that was just, um, uh, we uh, just showed it for the first time uh, two weeks ago, that's brand new, um, where we draw on vertigo. That's like, you know, the experience that you have when you look from somewhere really high up, but any kind of balance experience as a form of experiencing our body as play. And for that, um, can I just all ask you to kindly stand up for me for a second, because I want you to really experience that. Um, please put your laptop away, very important. Very simple. We're going to do a very simple exercise to experience the body as play. So you just look at me, and I want you to now like spin around, and this is one count and two counts. I just want you to spin it out six times at least. All right? Three, two, one, go. One, two, three, four, five, six. Great. And this can be great fun. So I'm going to show you a little video of what we did with that knowledge. Vertigo has been described in game design as games that attempt to momentarily destroy the stability of perception and inflict a kind of voluptuous panic, or pleasurable panic, upon an otherwise lucid mind. So, for example, Vertigo games could include simply spinning in circles, skiing, racing fast cars, and even rock climbing. With our work, we investigate how we can design digital Vertigo games by taking advantage of the digital technology now available to us. To investigate this, we built Balance Ninja. Balance Ninja is a two-player balance game where players directly affect the balance of their opposing player. Firstly, 
Players stand on a balance board and move their upper body to the left and to the right, and we measure this lean with a mobile device. Secondly, through using a technology called Galvanic Vestibular Stimulation, or GVS for short, the game directly affects a player's sense of balance. With GVS, a small current of around 1.5 milliamps is applied to electrodes attached behind players' ears. The resultant effect is that the player's sense of balance is affected in the direction of the positive electrode, causing them to lean in that direction. So basically, when one person leans to the right, the GVS of the opposing player triggers in that same direction, which makes the other player lean and attempt to compensate. The object and challenge of Balance Ninja is to cause the opposing player to touch their ball to the floor whilst trying to remain balanced themselves. Points are scored by getting the other player to touch their board down, and the first player to 5 points wins. Exploring the design of digital vertigo games in this way has provided a few insights into how players may want to experience these games. It's different from you know, playing video games maybe with, just with your computer. It's, you're actually playing against someone It's right in front of you. You want to keep fighting against your own body and fighting against your opponent, uh, and that's not something you usually get in a standard digital game. Drawn on the fun of Vertigo games we play as children, we aim to highlight that Vertigo can be an intriguing gameplay element for game designers. So this um, is called Balance Ninja. We showed that around um, uh, the world now, had people experienced that. And then we did a little study. We usually don't um, do questionnaires, we rather do qualitative data, but here we thought we'd do a questionnaire and I'll show you the, 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 the most surprising result for me uh, was this. 50% um, of the people said that the sensation was uncomfortable, right? What you probably just experienced too. It's uncomfortable. Um, however, uh, more than 75% said the game was fun. And even more of that, almost 90% would play the game again. So you can make your players uncomfortable, yet make them want to play the game again. And I think the reason why they did that was because 50% of the people said that they felt that they were in control of their body, and the other 50% said they were not in control of their body. So I think it's a really intriguing game element to change the amount of control you give and take away from players. So if I want to um, sum up the, the things that you learned from Balance Ninja was that digital vertigo via galvanic vestibular stimulation, and uh, you know you can go to a website and actually rebuild the system with an Arduino for about 20 bucks, um, is an intriguing form to experiencing our body as digital play. But then, um, after we learned that, um, this work was actually inspired from the uh, work we did with cyclists because that was another way we would try to experiencing the body as play. And you need to know that in Australia it's, um, it's compulsory law that you actually wear a helmet um, on a bicycle at all times. And we thought, can we actually use that to experiencing our body as play by seeing the helmet as a tool to facilitate play? And this is what uh, uh, Wouter, who worked on that mostly, came up with. So at the Exertion Games Lab, we research the intersection between technology, the play, and the body. Um, because we believe we sit way too much in our work lives. And we want to get people excited about being physically active again. What we've been working on for the past couple of months is a helmet that is able to show information to the outside world. We did that by turning it into a kind of low resolution display, by covering it with LEDs. And all of these LEDs are multicolored and we can control them individually, which means that um, you can display patterns on it, numbers, colors. And what we've been thinking about is what does it mean when your helmet becomes interactive? What does it mean when it can show information about yourself? And we've been talking with different user groups that use helmets in their activities like cycling or skateboarding or construction workers and we asked them what would you do um, with a helmet that has this kind of capability how could it help you in your activities helmet is a static object that is there to protect us when we fall and for the rest of the time it's just there it's not doing anything so we thought this is perfect we have this object that's clearly visible to everybody else and that we can use as a means of communication the research is important because we believe if we make wearing a helmet uh, more engaging, more fun, 
we can actually not only facilitate um, more people to wear helmets, um, which can increase safety, but also inspire us to think about how technology can create new opportunities for engagement and get really people to think about how we can facilitate and inject play back into physical activity to get people excited about moving their bodies again. So this is the work on the Luma Helm and I just want to um, highlight here uh, one of the results. Um, we can see the body now as a display, right? And I was actually really proud when I typed that in because I figured out that there is the word play in display. Um, uh, but unlike clothes that I display for us for centuries, um, we can now make them interactive and dynamic. And if we, sorry, and um, um, if we do that, we can facilitate novel play experiences. This is what happened when we gave people this Luma Helm. We gave them the version where um, it visualized their heart rate, right? So we used a heart rate monitor and visualized their heart rate. And then people cycled off. And of course, you know, they engaged in competitions who gets their heart rate up the highest. We expected that, this, exa this is what happened, great. But then they also invented this new kind of play that they called meditation cycling. And meditation cycling works in the following way. You try to cycle as fast as possible by going in the lowest gear, so you go really, really fast in order to get your heart rate up. But then they talk to each other in order to get their heart rate low. And the way they talk to each other was, relax, it's a Sunday afternoon quiet right so they try to calm each other down while using their legs to get their heart rate up and that was a new type of play experience facilitated ex um, as the body as play that was only possible because we now have these sensors such as um, heart rate monitors and LEDs that can visualize that and so forth and because we really liked working with cyclists we also worked with joggers and we were really intrigued by um, uh, quadcopters that you see now everywhere. And we thought, we thought maybe we can use quadcopters to support joggers in their activity. And we were lucky enough that um, a local TV station um, uh, was interested in that. And they did a little video about the project. And I'll just show you a very beginning of that video. <laughs> It can be hard sometimes to find the motivation to go for the morning run. What I need is a personal trainer. Or a robot. This is Joggerbot, a flying robot. It's one of the projects being developed in the Exertion Games Lab at Melbourne's RMIT. So what we are interested in the lab is the intersection between the body, play and technology. And sports and exercise is a form of play for us. And we believe the way to explore this is by actually creating these type of experiences that we see can happen in 10 years' time. So that's why we designed Joggerboard in order to understand how it would be to interact with an embodied flying system. Joggerboard is based on a commercially available quadrocopter. And what we've done is now we kind of repurposed it for being a jogging companion. So we changed the software around, and what it does now, it's got a little camera, and with the camera, we track the jogger. Um, in fact, the jogger's T-shirt, that we put a special marker on, and program the software so that it stays, it always knows where the jogger is, and stays at a certain distance. And then we modify the distance to understand how people react to the jogger board when they're exercising. Okay, so the camera, that's the, the camera there? That's the camera there, yes. So can we have a look under the bonnet? Sure, yeah, so there's an, um, a sensor that measures, measures the altitude. Uh, oh, so you can choose whether it flies at, say, this height or this height. So, yeah, we did the software that does that because we want to figure out what does it actually mean if the jogger board flies, like, on chest level, what happens if it flies higher, right? You know, if this takes on the role of a coach, if the coach looks down to you, yeah. what does it do to you? Yeah. What, if yeah. it, what if it changes if it flies lower? Is it more like a dog when it is actually is much lower? So these are the kind of questions we really want to explore. So, so I guess if, yeah, if you're looking up to it, there might be a chance that you know, you're feeling slightly inferior to it and you'll do what it says, where if you're looking down on it, you'll say, no, I'm not going to run faster. Exactly, yeah. Well? All right, I fast forward here because I want to tell you what actually happened. So we went into a park with the jogger board and gave that to joggers. And the most surprising result for me was that the robot's exertion can support the human's exertion investment, facilitating connectedness. Let me explain you what I mean by that. Um, if you know 
the um, uh, run or other Nike Plus apps. The experience was very different to that um, because people, people first of all, um, called the jogger board a she or a he, so they assigned a gender. She was very hard for me today. He took it easy with me. And, um, uh, you know, very different to if I have a Nike Plus app. I would never call an app a she or he, I think. Um, and the also the other th interesting thing was because, you know, the quadcopters, they have limit battery life. They don't work um, in the rain or in the wind very well, and they're very loud. And we thought these are all things that we need to kind of fix engineering-wise. But when you actually had people run with it, they said, no, 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 it's fine that the battery runs out because I always run out out of steam. And, you know, I always try to run at least so that I run a little bit further than before the battery dies. Um, I also don't like that it, um, I, I like that it doesn't work in the rain because I also don't like jogging in the rain. So I have an excuse not to go. Um, I also start puffing. I get louder the more exhausted I get. So all of a sudden there was a sense of connectedness with that system that you don't necessarily have with a non-embodied app, uh, jogging support app. And I think this is really interesting to experience the body as play. This is also very important um, to the work. Of course, not all the work um, concerns, you know, um, hardcore exertion like cycling or jogging. We also work with people um, in hospital. And this is Dr. Giggles work we did with hospital, with children um, in a hospital. And I want you just just think about for 10 seconds on your own for, um, uh, for me, please. Just look around the room and try to identify the way where you could play in this room. Just for 10 seconds. Have a look. How would you play in here? Right, you might think, ah, oh, this is great things so I could hang up there, but let's say that is not allowed. Then you might think, I want to run around, but let's say that is also not encouraged. Le you know, let's say you want to do, ah, oh, I want to climb up on here and jump on there. You might not be physically able to, and this is all exactly how kids in hospital feel like. They want to play, but they are so limited in the amount of, in particular, bodily play that they can do. But playing is super important in hospital, not just um, despite them being in hospital, but because they are in hospital. Because from play therapy, we know that play is the child's natural medium of self-expression. It is an opportunity which is given to the child to play out his or her feelings and problems. Just as in certain types of adult therapy, an individual talks out his or her difficulties. So for children, it's a way to play out their challenges. How do you do that in a hospital? Well, now, you know, this, this quote was from 47, but now finally there's no play therapy rooms in hospitals. But so far they mostly contain toys and craft material. There's not much digital. And if you see something digital, you see things such as this, which uses VR in order to distract the children from the hospital experience. And distraction um, is one way to go about it, but as harsh as it sounds, that hospital experience is life for the children. This is there 24-7. It concerns their parents, concerns their siblings, concerns their school, concerns everything. So I don't think you can just distract them for a little while and hope they forget about the hospital. That's not going to work. And if you remember the, um, the vision that I showed you earlier, um, from playing with the digital to playing with the digital, using your bodies to experiencing our bodies as play, you hopefully agree with me that the VR approach is like the, um, the old fashioned approach to distract people. But what we rather want to see is engagement with the hospital experience. In other words, what we're trying to do is we want to help children in hospital experiencing their world as a playground. So that was our intention, and the way we did it is we talked to a lot of um, children, we talked to play therapists, doctors, and so forth, and we came up with the idea to create workshops. Um, this is a workshop we did that um, in, uh, all over the world. One of them was in Spain. We invited people, uh, children in the hospital together with their parents, according to play therapy, and their siblings to these workshops. And before they could engage with the digital play, we actually gave them to do craft activities. But they weren't allowed to do any use anything but scissors and glue and, um, and anything they could find in the hospital environment. So we, for example, taught them how to make these beautiful X-ray shadow um, pictures or puppets. And they were cut out, out of the children's own X-ray pictures. 
So it's their bones that now make the bones out of these animals. And then um, they could engage with Dr. Giggles, which is a, a, a very simple game in which the roles are reversed. The doctor is now the patient and the child is the doctor. And we scanned in the, um, the face of their doctor. And then because Ruth um, uh, is also a play therapist, there's a lot of giggling in that game because it's based on um, uh, laughter therapy. And then the children have to now drag the doctor around um, in the operating theater, including the x-ray machine. And if they dragged it on the x-ray machine, the x-ray uh, uh, puppets appeared in the virtual world because we secretly scanned them in during the workshop. Similarly, they could play X Safari, which is a game that contains a virtual horse. And for that, they had to create these hand gloves made out of operating theater gloves, bandages, um, uh, cotton buds, and so forth. And they did these beautiful um, figurines that then they put over this um, glove we developed in order to then control this virtual horse with these horse-like movements. And what we learned from these workshops is not only had the parents and the children a lot of fun, um, we also were able to reframe the hospital experience. By using a hospital material as a resource for play, um, the children had a much more playful engagement with that material. The most remarkable uh, quote for me was when one of the children had to actually step out to get um, treatment um, uh, temporarily, and then the other child, the other children are realizing that and said, ah, you're getting your x-rays done, please bring back your x-ray sheet because I want to create another giraffe. Similarly, um, ownership is changed here because we can support auto topography. Auto topography is a fancy word for basically meaning um, that we as human beings like to decorate our physical environment with things to make it our own. That's the reason why I print out my digital photos in order to put them on my fridge, because I make the space my own. But children in the hospital don't really have a chance to do that, so they really jumped onto that opportunity to use these physical puppets in order to decorate their IV drip, in order to decorate their wheelchair. And the parents really appreciated that because it allowed them to take pictures and send them to their other family members at home, rather than just an um, uh, almost lifeless-like um, child um, in a hospital bed. So the result here is that even a sick body can be a resource for play, and we need to nurture that. One uh, more thing I want to show you, which is sweat atoms, because we were also inspired by all these activity trackers that track your activity and then again use digital representations to show you something. We were wondering what happens if we don't leave it as digital, but rather 3D print it as a physical token that you can carry around with you. Um, how does that change your engagement with being physically active? And that sweat atoms came out of that. I'm a very active person and I take my exercise seriously. I like to track my exercise using heart rate monitor. 92. Current mode of virtual interaction is limiting my experience. For example, I can't do much with the data apart from reading the screen. So today I'm exploring a new mode of interaction with the data. heartbeat out of this heartbeat pressure monitor and then this data is sent through the sweat atom application which I can save into the USB stick and now I can print a 3D object that is uh, my heartbeat shape. So this is the heartbeat rate of today which I was having some running in the park in the morning. In the afternoon, I was like wandering around and did some shopping. And during the day, I, I was sitting in the office. These are the flower models of my heartbeat last two days. As my heart rate goes up, the lengths become longer. This is a dye model. I got it uh, yesterday. So that each phase represents one zone and the amount of time I spend in that zone. These are my frog models, and as I exercise more, the frog becomes bigger. The each bubble you see here is the how many hours I spend for exercising.
so we've done that, right? And the change to plastic, a 3D printed artifact, really changes how you talk about physical activity. You engage in much more storytelling rather than comparing results. And we thought, what if we can take that actually a step further? And then we created this chocolate printer that prints your hardware in chocolate. And now our uh, local TV station got a hold of that. And they, of course, wanted to make a piece of that. And we really wanted to make people think about different ways of representing uh, data. But then in the end, you're going to hear um, they asked a, um, a, a health expert, a dietitian, and she actually, uh, you, you, you'll see, she didn't like the idea of chocolate. Sweating up a storm is being rewarded with sweet treats as part of a new study. 3D printing technology is taking data from heart rate monitors and transforming the results into chocolate. Madeline Slattery explains. It's a motivational message dripping in chocolate. Everything that's printed here is a reflection of Kate Russell's daily exercise. I basically said an hour a day and I got a straight face last night. She's been wearing a heart rate monitor that connects to the printer. At the end of the day, it reveals how good or bad she's been using symbols and subtle hints. If the person has done a lot of exercise, then it would say, well done, mate. If the person hasn't done much exercise, he would still get a chocolate, but the message would be slightly different. Rohit came up with the technology after finding results on fitness apps lacked imagination. Why not uh, make it much more tangible and cherishing? It can even print what the user's heart rate looked like over the day. For Kate, it's a fun way to gauge how her fitness goals are tracking. It takes you away from all your screens because you have to actually watch something uh, that's not the screen. The reason chocolate is being used is because it's one of the best mediums for 3D food printing, not to mention something most people enjoy. But it's just a small treat. Each printout contains just two squares. Dark chocolate that which you are using also have some form of health benefits. Even so, dietitians think a spoonful of sugar shouldn't be an incentive for breaking a sweat. Well, I'd suggest that it wasn't a food that we were rewarded with. Maybe just the smiley face or the frown face would be enough. Madeline Slattery, Nine News. All right, you, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it with that. Um, now to conclude, I just want to go back uh, one step and go higher level because I showed you now a couple of examples of how we can experience our body as play. But because um, you know the topic of the festival is motivation, I want to talk about um, how can we actually, or let me rephrase it, um, remember the example that I gave when the little um, girl walked on that plank, right? We thrive on having overcome these unnecessary obstacles. So there's a lot about intrinsic motivation that you probably know about, but how do we facilitate that and why is it that people feel intrinsically motivated to do these things? And I hope you hopefully agree with me that some of these um, might be intrinsically motivating for you. And I think what we can do is we can learn from adventure to facilitate the experience to facilitate experiencing the body as play. Adventure is very important. So the last thing I want to show you is what we did with adventure, which is not your typical game, but I think we, as game designer, can learn a lot from adventure. And for that, uh, I want to point you to the work from Sarah. She's in the lab, um, and uh, she's an artist researcher. So she conducts um, art, and she decided about three years ago to climb Mount Everest to perform art on the mountain. Um, last year she finally, you know, it takes a lot of training, preparation. Um, last year she finally got, um, uh, she got the right fitness level, but also the permit to go. And then she had a guide and uh, then she um, climbed Mount Everest. Um, this is part of the track here. Um, she documented, she tried to document everything she experienced with her GoPro. Uh, this is in the tent. So this is my little home for the next uh, 60 days or so. Um, so. We won't have Wi-Fi for a few more days. So of course, you know, she talked about technology because it's what I'm interested in, but Wi-Fi wasn't her biggest problem. Uh, after that, it became really cold, you know, minus 10 in the tent uh, at night, plus 40 uh, during the day. Um, but she finally reached um, Everest Base Camp, which is the last stop um, before you reach the summit. Okay, looking over my shoulder, we can see Base Camp for the first time. Uh, we've come past the Kumbu Glacier. Um, it's an absolutely stunning day here. Like a little city in amongst the rocks and the ice. And it is kind of exciting. 
So, but then what happened was, this is her guide, and her guide said something doesn't feel right about the mountain. Right? Remember that was an experience. Everybody experienced something differently. And he said, something doesn't feel right. And he abandoned the expedition and descended. And Sarah, you know, is not allowed to climb up on her own. So she had to actually hike back to the nearest town, find a new guide and um, a new permit. And this is then what happened. Sorry, we just had a 7.9 earthquake on the Richter scale. We've had numerous aftershocks. There's buildings all around us that have um, come down and collapsed. We have no Wi-Fi here. We've run down to the street to be able to send a message to loved ones to say that we're safe and alive. Uh, but others are not so lucky. So you might remember when the news happened, the earthquake uh, struck in Nepal, right when um, Sarah was there. Uh, for her, because there was no internet right afterwards, no TV, no radio, um, for her, it was um, uh, that's what she experienced, but she didn't know the extent. Only two days later, through the newspaper of all media, she learned that um, over um, 20,000 people um, died, over, eight of over 5 million people were dislocated, um, and on the mountain it actually triggered an avalanche and killed 22 people, um, including some of the people she, she just met the other day. Um, the adventure um, uh, wasn't quite over there yet, then she had to hike for eight days without sanitation and water to the nearest embassy who then evacuated her out of the country. So certainly an adventure with a lot of expected and unexpected um, events. We looked into that and, you know, thank God she was fine, um, but we thought, is there anything that we can learn about the use of technology and adventure? And we identified that there's this design space which is really um, uh, in interesting because there are instrumental and experiential aspects to every adventure. What I mean by instrumental, for example, her GPS helped her with the exper experimental um, uh, goal to get up the mountain. Right? That's what the GPS is good for. But also in terms of the experiential aspect to an adventure is really important. And that's, for example, her 360 degree camera allowed her to capture her adventure, to use it for storytelling afterwards, which didn't really help her get up the mountain, but certainly supported her in experiencing that adventure. But for every adventure, there is this perpendicular dimension, which is about the expected and the unexpected. The expected was certainly getting to base camp zero, but the unexpected, for example, the worst one was obviously the earthquake. But for every adventure, there are small little unexpected things that make it exciting. You don't want to miss out on them. But if you look at this now, you can identify four roles of technology design in that. And there are coach, rescuer, documentarian, and mentor. For example, a coach, this is the um, a typical um, the jawbone. She had a jawbone with her in the beginning of her training that functioned as a coach. It taught her how to sense when she's done 10,000 steps a day. And once you have acquired that skill, you might check a couple of more times, but then once you have that skill, you don't need that tool anymore and you let go of that coach. That's why people get rid of their um, Fitbits and so forth. Because they function as coach, which is great, but not all of it. Because we also need technology that functions as rescuer. Um, typical example, that's a personal locator beacon that used to cost about 3,000, now they cost about 300. This is the one that I actually have. Um, it's a very simple device. It's a device that you never uh, want to use because you, it only has one button and you press it in order to call emergency services over satellite. But then there's also the role of a documentarian and probably um, Sarah's chest-mounted GoPro functioned as a documentarian because it allowed her to have unique viewpoints of her experience. But then for the last one, as a mentor, there wasn't really much technology available to help her. A mentor is different than a coach because it helps you understand what the adventure means for you. And we really would have liked to have some technology that helped her with the trauma of that earthquake experience. Now, I want to go back to, you know, designing games for people like this guy. Let's say you want to design a game that helps um, this person to go jogging. We propose that we can actually learn from adventure to help guys like him with our two-dimensional design space. Because for every jog, you might have instrumental goals. I want to get home safely, okay? But it's also experiential. You might go exactly the same route for exactly the same time, but on one day you feel great, on another day you feel really shitty. It's a very personal experience. 
also for every jog, the thing there are expected things. I expect to run within a certain 50 minute um, time frame and unexpected things. I might sprain my ankle, um, the weather might turn bad, a car is overtaking too fast. There's always unexpected things, such like in an adventure. And in order to really understand that why people engage in these things, um, I want to point to Mallory's quote, this is almost 100 years old. Um, he said, why would you climb Mount Everest? And he said, because it's there. So there's seemingly no point in climbing Mount Everest or doing similar adventures. But that's exactly the point that there is no point to that. Because adventure can help personal growth. That's why people do that, in order to help facilitate experience personal growth. And that, we believe, if you use that two-dimensional design space from perspective of personal growth, what you can do then is learn from this extreme adventure and then apply that to everyday exertion activities such as jogging, but applies to any other um, activity, and then reframe it that we learned from the hospital work as a mini adventure rather than a task to do that just delays death. And that can facilitate per personal growth, just like in adventure. And with that, I want to sum up. Hopefully I could excite you about experiencing the body as digital play. I've shown you a couple of examples from our lab. We talked about new technology to experience the body as play via Balanced Ninja. We talked about the helmet. We learned how we can use quadcopters as embodied jogging companions. And um, we learned about the hospital as a playground and about the power of material representations of physical activity via means of sweat atoms. And lastly, we wrapped it all up with seeing play as facilitating personal growth. And I think that's the take home message here that if you really want to experience the body as digital play, you should design for play that facilitates personal, personal growth. And with that, um, my name is Floyd Müller from the Exertion Games Lab. I'll wrap, up, I'll wrap up and thank you for your attention. Thank you. I think we have time for one or two questions. So, are there questions? Also, if, if you do not yourself uh, things in exercise or rehabilitation, you don't see how, uh, how, yeah, perhaps, yeah, you don't, you have another perspective if you really do yourself rehabilitation or extra games, because one of the biggest problem is really this optimizing, oder? First, you think always the challenge is to do something like optimize your, your, your yoga <laughs> and things like this. And of course, this is uh, a first approach, but it can't be the only. Therefore, it's interesting that you say it has to be this uh, personal growth as a, as a challenge. But we have... Uh, Question? <laughs> well, thank you, Floyd, very much for your interesting and exciting talk. I'm actually interested in this uh, Luma helmet example and I'm um, interested in the game mechanics or if there are game mechanics of this um, experiment you talked about when you bike really fast wearing the helmet and you try to soothe each other down with calming sentences. Is the, um, the goal to influence each other, like the display of the helmet, to become a certain pattern or something? Or I wasn't sure if I caught that. Uh, well, we left it open. A toy, like a toy where you can develop games for each other. Thanks.
did you did you also do tests about um, how the this technology layer might impair the security of the helmet? Because I think that's that might be a possible uh, uh, downside. Uh, y so y yes, good good question. Um, so we worked with uh, Bicycle Victoria, which is like our bicycle organization. Um, so. Uh, the that question has two answers. One is, of course, you have to be very careful not to actually damage the um, integrity of the helmet, right? Um, so we worked, for example, in a very specific glue that doesn't affect the plastic on it. Um, we didn't do um, any um, uh, stress testing like with the dummy, but we worked really hard to make sure that the helmet is untouched per se. So that's number one. Um, so yes, you have to work with the uh, authorities to ensure that. But of course, you know, then you have the question of what happens if you all of a sudden have um, uh, um, an illuminating uh, device in addition to the lights that you already have on your bicycle. That's maybe the other part of the question. And um, uh, interestingly, the experts were very divided about that. Some said if you have another illuminating device that will distract from the div uh, from the lights that you already have on your on your uh, on your bike, and you shouldn't have that. We actually checked, you know, whether there are some laws regarding that, but there aren't. And you see now more and more actually cyclists using um, their lights on their helmet. Um, that's a that's a um, appropriation of that technology that has never been put into um, into place in any law in any world that uh, in any country in the world I know of. But other people actually said the more light, the better, because the more light uh, that makes them more likely to be seen and that can only be healthy for the, um, uh, for the cyclists. So the experts were very divided on that. Um, it's really good, I think, to see that um, there's a DIY community now in New York that really wants to make cycling safer in New York City, which you know, obviously is, um, has a lot of car traffic. And they build basically um, a copy of their Luma Herman, distribute that among the Adreno folks in, um, in New York in order to just help people be safer on their bike. So it kind of becomes became a grassroot bottom-up approach, which I kind of really like. But then, yeah, it's up to the legislation to like, make sure that they can actually um, uh, support that in the right way. But they're always behind with these things. You know? they, they told us about stories, how they're still discussing whether the thing in the back should be better orange or red. And it's like, you know, way behind to what we can now do with interactive systems. There was yeah, a question in the back here. Um, you can't buy our product. Um, our Luma Helm um, was for exploration, and we wanted to make it available open source. So you can actually go to our website and download the instructions and build your own. We have a lot of things on Instructables because we want to help people grassroots, um, bottom-up approach um, use that. Um, the guys in New York build a simplified version that is even cheaper and easier for people to build, so you can also use that. Uh, I'm also happy to um, uh, uh, say that there is now a company that builds a very similar helmet uh, for um, uh, skiing and snowboarding um, that has, yeah, as I said, a very simple, uh, um, um, a simpler functionality, but very uh, much inspired by the system. We wish the company would admit that they had the idea from us, you know, um, but of course they don't say that because, you know, patent and so forth, but that's fine because we just want to make more people experience their bodies as play. So, um, yes, like if, if, you, if you Google uh, snowboard, helmet, light, you will see something, you go, ah, that very much sounds like that. That came out right after ours. Ours was in the press quite a lot. So um, we hope we were able to inspire them. That's the answer. Sure, yeah? Right. Uh, y y yes is the short answer. Um, I'm trying to, like every time, because we've got um, some really expert neuroscientists um, in the university, and uh, we really much agree with the intertwinedness between the mind and the body. And uh, we're trying to understand them. And the really, really difficult language is that they're using. <laughs> and, um, you know, um, 
and that they look at our stuff and go, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, you're using such and such uh, mechanism, but you know, it's much, much more complex than simplify that to a play experience. So we really have this, like, um, you know, these experts that can say something about really minuscule detail about the body-mind um, uh, interplay, and then we are kind of like the the designers that were kind of down there for them. So we're trying to kind of bridge that. And it often kind of goes that we go from here to there, to here, to there, to here, to here. And then we kind of go in a circle around that. And hopefully have something that has an impact on people's life, um, make them experience life more as play, while drawing from these things. For example, what I always want to do is I want to put one of the people that um, um, experience our games uh, into an MFRI. Uh, and, and study what happens there. But we haven't done that yet, so that's certainly an interesting area. And uh, what I really want, um, for example, what we've done now is, um, uh, Patrick had this cool thing, because um, uh, um, you know, you can put more and more um, electronics now onto your body, onto your, um, we've seen enough clothes, and there's enough now on the skin, um, but I'm really interested in what if you actually swallow um, these devices, because I think that there's really great potential. There's now, um, we've got a thing that uh, measures your body temperature and you swallow it, and then you know, of course, it goes down your body and about 48 hours, um, you can recycle it. Um, and um, that now and is connected via Bluetooth, right? So if I swallow that, you can kind of approach me and via your phone see how close you get the signal and where kind of the sender is. So you can kind of body scan over me with your iPhone where the signal is and what my body temperature is inside. I find that immensely playful. I have no idea what for, but I find this very intriguing, right? Um, and so, yes, yeah, we, we like to play around with that. It's of course, you know, we, we can't give that out to people yet because it's only me who swallows that because if something breaks, then why not? Um, different ethical question, uh, but I find that really intriguing. I think that's where some of the new stuff comes in. So if, you know, if I could, you know, drill a hole in my brain and connect something there. We also, also exciting. But the neuroscientists, they kind of tell me off for that. Good, yeah, one more, last one. Uh, very good question. Thanks for that. Um, uh, it's actually not that expensive um, uh, for starters, uh, but I, I, I know where the question comes from, right? So um, in the beginning, I said our goal for the lab is to inspire game companies where games can and should be in 10 years' time, right? So we're trying to um, kind of anticipate and shape the future. So we're trying to play with technologies such as the, the, the swallowing electronics there that we believe in the future will be available um, cheaply and um, accessible. Like for example, a mobile phone, a um, uh, couple of years out, people would have said, I can't afford a mobile computer. Now everybody has one, even in, uh, uh, in India, the mobile phone is widespread and in other uh, 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 developing countries. Um, for example, when we started the work with the Joggerbot, the quadcopter, the first quadcopter we bought was about 5,000 US dollars and it was the cheapest one we could get. Right now, if you go to your um, uh, local children's store, you can get these quadcopters that are about that big, and they cost 12 euros, 12 euros, which would have been unheard in that. Now, of course, you know this one doesn't fly outside as well as the $5,000 one, but because they're 12 euros, I can buy like two, three, ten, and let them jog with me, and then they might crash, and the battery dies, and then I fire up another one. Right, so I think with that, you know, it, it raises issues of uh, sustainability, and that's what we had with the uh, with the printing, um, with the 3D printing, of course, uh, as well, of course. Um, but technology changes so quickly. So what we are trying to understand is how can we utilize that technology and shape it in a positive way, rather than let it develop um, in, um, uh, on its own and by technology-driven perspectives, rather than a human perspective. So we believe these technologies will become more accessible, cheaper, and more available. And we just want to shape them in the right direction. So that's that. Great, thank you. Thank you. And <laughs> also thank you for fighting with this cable. And <laughs> so
So, uh, we go further in the program.